Okay, so you start taking it more and more and withdrawing and losing interest in other activities. Yes. Um, where do we go from there? So, so um, I, during this kind of time in my life, um, I, after I had graduated from high school, um, so I was 18, is when I met my uh, future wife. Um, up until this point, I had had uh, quote unquote girlfriends, but they were they were more like just friends. Okay, they weren't. It was not any serious relationship. Because you thought um, of yourself as gay, right? So it was like this is this. It was uncomfortable. Like I, I, I thought I had to. I constantly was thinking of how to act like a straight person with this girl that I'm with. Um, for example, I remember my, my seventh grade, my eighth grade girlfriend, um, she, we were at the movie theater and, um, she was taking my hand and, and putting it on her breast. And it made, not only did it make me uncomfortable, but I didn't want to do that. And, um, all of my friends, my guy friends were sitting there and they were looking and they were laughing and they, they were just thinking like, what is, what the hell's your problem, Tom? Why are you not like? hello are you not like all you know all for that um and it really deeply like just offended me because uh little did they know i i felt self-conscious about acting as if i was straight and um anyway so a lot of experiences kind of like that um but no no serious no serious girlfriends um and so i i was let me describe this okay my bisexuality is like this. I am overall more sexually and physically attracted to males. However, um, I do not have any attraction or desire for an emotional, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 an emotional bond with a mate who is male. Okay. That there's not any because of the the, the sexual abuse was purely sexual, right? It's purely physical. That is that that's the end of my bisexuality in that in that regard. So, but although I'm more attracted um, to uh, males in general, that doesn't mean that I am not attracted to. I mean, obviously, um, my my wife. You know, we have an honest relationship, and it's not like I'm faking our our marriage. She knew the first, you know, <laughs> she knew the first day we were dating up front the way that I was. But um, I, it took some time for me to develop really a liking and, a, and an, an attraction really in general for women. But um, um, up until this point, um, meeting my, my future wife, um, I wasn't like you know, when I first met her, it wasn't like I was swept off my feet. And it wasn't because she's not attractive. I mean, my friends at that time were like, dude, Tom, she's, she looks amazing, man. She's so, she's so hot, whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I guess. <laughs> and I, I, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't, does that make sense? I uh -huh. didn't like, yeah, I didn't does. understand yeah. what a hot girl looked like that for some reason. Sure. sure. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, what is, what is special about my relationship with my wife is that, um, she was the first female that, that I had a deep, um, physical and emotional attraction, uh, you know, attraction to, and a, a connect and a bond with, she was the first and she mm -hmm she um really pretty much is the only <laughs> uh you know i i i just have a hard time you know being attracted necessarily to um you, you know when you're I mean, obviously when you're married okay you're you know that doesn't mean you can't appreciate if someone is is beautiful right or someone is good looking mm -hmm. sure um so that's what i'm trying to say like i i just my wife is like she, she is just the only woman I really am attracted to. And I, 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 
um, I, like I said, I was very upfront with her and that I, um, I was this way and she accepted me and she was kind to me and it didn't bother her. Um, and, um, so we have a very open relationship in that in that sense and i don't have to be afraid or ashamed of the fact that i i am bisexual and that i have that aspect to me and i and i fortunately am not in a marriage where i have to lie to myself that i'm you know um uh, attracted to my, my wife i you know yeah i'm sure. just grateful for that no, that happens. And if, if for those who want another story or an example, the Josh and Lolly Weed episode that I did on Mormon Stories, Josh Weed self-identifies as gay, and he says he's in love with and sexually attracted to his wife, uh, Laurel or Lolly. And there mm-hmm. are others, Ty Mansfield and others claim something similar. Um, okay, mm-hmm. so so um, as far as someone asks how you knew when you were addicted versus just a user. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm also curious if you went on to serve a mission. So talk, talk about the first, those two questions. Okay. So first, how did you, how did you know when you were addicted versus just using? So like I said, uh, the first time I realized I was addicted was right before my temple wedding. It was just in the, the months prior to, Okay. Getting married in the temple. So you didn't and serve a mission. I did. I did not. Okay. And the, the the reason was that I I honestly just did not feel like that was what I was meant to do. I had so much crap uh, that was not worked out mentally and emotionally that I just that wasn't something that. I desire to do wasn't something that I could mentally take on. Right. I just had. Sure. Yeah. I had all these other things, but you did want to, you did want to, um, you did want to get married in the temple. Uh, yes. Yeah. Th- that's that great. was always one of my, well, yeah, it was always one of my goals and, and my wife and I had to, um, uh, work on it. You know, we couldn't just go straight into the temple. Um, and, um, I, I had stopped using drugs completely, um, but I ended up getting a prescription of painkillers for, you know, I think it was for my back. I was telling myself that it was necessary for me to have this prescription, um, which is, you know, sort of a self lie that, that I told myself. And I, I knew I was addicted because it was interfering with all other aspects of my life. I could not go socialize without being high. I could not, um, uh, you know, it was more important to make sure that I was high first and then everything else follows. That's when you, that's like a true addiction. Like when even over your family, the drug becomes the ultimate, um, it becomes what is most necessary. Because if think about it, if you can't if you can't be high and feeling good, and you're withdrawing, you can't take care of your family. You can't go to work. You can't, you know, function like a person when you're, you know, look like you're deathly ill, withdrawing. Um, and I I also at that time um, when I ran out of my medication, I was going through withdrawal. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I was uh, physically dependent on the drug, um, so I, I had to get more. But um, I ended up, um, you know, kind of coming to terms with that that I I was addicted. I I needed to 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 kick this addiction, and I did. I went cold turkey, got off of it, um, went through the withdrawals, and I got married in the temple. And I thought <laughs> at this point that everything was okay. Incidentally, incidentally, I think it's interesting to note that while, in fact, do you keep the word of wisdom is a temple recommend question. uh, Most Mormons think word of wisdom means uh, alcohol, uh, you know, illegal drugs, 
and coffee and tea, which in many cases are super healthy. And I yeah. don't, I, I wonder how many, how many Mormons are still attending the temple or, or getting temple recommends with, mm-hmm. with an opiate addiction. No, oh. re- not really. Oh, I see. Either lying or not really. Uh, They're you know, denial, you mean, right? Thinking of that as being yeah. against the word of wisdom. Yeah. Right. And is it against yeah. the word of wisdom? Because I don't know that Joseph it, Smith was thinking about opiates when he. <laughs> you know what no, I mean? certainly not. And, yeah. and, and of course, in the church, you know, there's the whole thing about everything in moderation, right? And, um, you know, obviously something that is, uh, uh, you know, technically harmless, if it becomes a true addiction and becomes um, something that you have to have or you cannot function in other parts of your life, that can be bad, whether it be video games or, you know, right. whatever else. But, um, no, that, you know, it doesn't say in the – in the word of wisdom and the scriptures to not <laughs> take opiates. But, uh, it certainly, it certainly, uh, I, in my opinion would definitely be against the word of wisdom if they were being taken in a way that is not, uh, genuine, you know, for yeah. obviously your, your intent is to abuse it. So tell us about how the addiction played out once you got married. So I, was naive to, I I, I don't know. I just, I thought that I, I was naive. I thought that because I had kicked the pills and I got married in the temple that I would no longer, that this wouldn't come back, that this wouldn't be a problem in the future. I thought it was just over and done with. The thing is that when you become addicted and dependent on a drug, um, you basically are, even if you kick it, you're, you're sort of teaching yourself that when you are in a stressful situation or life, it really, you know, sucks or you're depressed that your coping mechanism, your ability to get through those tough situations is resorting back to using those drugs. So I, almost immediately after getting married, um, I, I justified getting a, a, a prescription for painkillers um, for some back pain. And I knew in the back of my head that, you know, this is probably stupid and this is not a good idea, but I convinced my wife that it would be okay. And um, I... Okay, okay to... Okay to to take them responsibly <laughs> and that I was going to take them responsibly and for a, a purpose other than abusing them. And right. I did at first, but of course, you know, an addict, just like an alcoholic, they can't just take a drink and put it down. It doesn't work that way. Um, you know, I was, I, I was naive to that idea. And um, so I just, I, you know, spun out of control. Um, uh, it became something that, that my wife obviously knew, like, you know, you can't take, ever take this again. Uh, Even if you're in legitimate pain, you are addicted. You cannot afford to take painkillers. Um, and I started, um, being secretive, um, and doing whatever I had to, to, to get my hands on drugs. And this is where, um, it really um, started to cut into our finances because prior to getting married, uh, not only was I not sharing my finances with somebody else, but I really got a lot of drugs without even having to pay for them. So at this point, I'm having to pay for all these drugs and they're very expensive. And, uh, (laughs) I had to look for excuses to justify where this money is going to. And you end up spinning this like intricate web of lies that is so well thought out and so like just well constructed. Uh, You know, it, 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 you just, you get sucked into this idea of lying. You almost tell yourself that you're not lying and, um, you just, 
you build this web of lies and, and, and then you realize that you are like in deep, <laughs> you're, you're in deep doo doo because you, you had lied about all these things, even little tiny things. And so, and so when that, when that web of lies gets exposed, it's not just like one lie. It's like all of these, all of these things. And it just causes a massive amount of distrust, you know, um, and uh, any time that I was discovered, um, you know, I would become like humble. I'd feel bad about it. I'd go talk to the bishop and um, <clears throat> I'd work on it and I would get, get better. What would the bishop and, say to help you? So I can't say that a bishop has ever been able to give me advice that was valuable in actually doing anything about it oh that's a good point john it's the classic answers it's the class or it's the classic suggestions of you know you need to read your scriptures more you need to pray more you need to go to the temple if and if you do xyz you will not be tempted okay every time well i don't know maybe that works for some people but when we're talking about a physical dependence to an opiate, you know, I just, that, that's not enough sometimes. That's that, maybe a lot of the times that's not enough to, um, you know, I, there are other things you have to do, like whether it be going to uh, NA, Narcotics Anonymous or, or AA or uh, outpatient rehab if you're married and have kids or, you know, there are other things that should be added to that. So I think it's dangerous when bishops um, uh, tend to, to think that they're giving all of the advice and help that is necessary by just saying, read your scriptures, go to church, go to the temple. What should a bishop or stake president or mission president say to someone who's struggling with uh, drug addiction? My current bishop i think said something really valuable <clears throat> um to me in the recent past um he he because he has ex because he has experience with someone in his family he was able to understand that he couldn't just tell me to do the primary answers you know as they or do the do the you know, you rec you're familiar with that, right? Do the primary answers or the yeah. primary, uh -huh. the, the yeah. base, primary basics. Yeah. He stated that he knew he couldn't s just suggest that and that that would be enough. And I never have had a bishop tell me this before. He said, I understand that you need additional help and that, that this isn't going to be um, something that gets fixed overnight. So what I, what, I think works is the, the the bishop also suggesting and helping with um, you know uh, therapy um, uh, definitely being able to identify why you were using drugs in the first place is vital otherwise you can't fight it um, Stephanie writes and this is dr. Stephanie the underlying trauma needs to be addressed drugs right. cover up our feelings of trauma from childhood or later even childhood memories that we don't remember it's how the brain is wired so Absolutely. um um so That's you're saying comment. it's not tell tell them it's not just read the scriptures pray just being loving christ and being faithful is not enough see ask them to get help and make sure yes. that they see a licensed professional psychologist uh, yeah. psychiatrist yes. absolutely licensed mental health professional who can help you get to the bottom of the root of yes. your pain and suffering yep. so that you can address the underpinning uh, pain that right. then begs for the drugs. Just like the doctor was, yeah, that's absolutely right. Just like the doctor was saying, you know, a lot of uh, parents, um, uh, you know, be, just because they don't know any better, um, and, and even bishops, um, you know, maybe think that, oh, just send you off to rehab and, you know, I, you're safe in rehab. There's not going to be drugs any around you and you're going to be able to get better and just be off of the drug long enough to, to learn to live without it. No, you need to address the root of the problem. Right. Just like 
just like we're saying. Carrie writes, bishops are not doctors. The primary answers are great and should happen, but I also agree with getting therapy and getting to the root of the problem. And then Carver writes, I always got a false sense of security from priesthood leaders about my problems. Hmm. Um, uh, and some yeah. bishops, Stephanie, Dr. Jackson writes that some bishops, there's still a taboo amongst some Mormon leaders about seeking, you know, psychologists or help from yeah. mental health professionals. Yes. Yep. That's and that's true. probably true outside of Mormonism. Okay. Mm. So bishops weren't particularly helpful, though you've had a good one recently. Talk more about how the drug use spiraled out of control, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. So you mean just like kind of like what it's like to be yeah. a drug addict? Yeah. And Okay. Okay. Um, and so, how, why you can't stop it? Like what, okay. when you just try and stop it, why you can't, you know? Okay. So, um, you know, people obviously who haven't experienced it tend to think that it's a lot easier than, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's never a good idea to think that, you know, better if you have not experienced it or just think that someone can just get over it. Um, which it, you know, it's kind of sad that some people believe that, um, uh, you know, you, I guess I should say I, I would pick up where I left off every time. And you hear this very commonly with drug addicts that, that let's say that they, um, uh, stopped, um, using drugs for a period of time. Um, and then they relapsed instead of starting small, they're going to pick up right where they, they left off. So with me kind of doing this roller coaster up and down thing through my marriage, um, it got progressively worse each time I relapsed. Um, the, 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 the pills would be harder, a harder drug. Um, I would do a lot more um, until eventually I hit a point where it's like, you know what, this isn't even worth spending all this money on these pills it's going to be more worth it to get heroin because heroin will last longer. Heroin, um, is, is cheaper, um, than buying these individual pills for $20 a piece, you know, um, <clears throat> that you're going to use, you know, just a few days and, and be done. Now but heroin to me is like a whole nother class of seriousness. I, I think of heroin along with meth, uh, maybe mm -hmm. crack and mm -hmm. as like, whoa, that right. that's serious, right? Yeah, that's a common, yeah, that's is a that, common. And is that true? Is heroin among <clears throat> the most dangerous and deadly of all drugs? See, that's not, that's not true when we're talking about, um, that's not true when we're talking about hard painkillers, okay? Because you can die from uh, the both of them if you're not careful. But where we are talking about probably y you'd be right in, in seriousness is shooting the drug rather than swallowing it or mm -hmm. smoking it. Mm -hmm. um, I, now, I'm not saying that taking Vicodin is equivalent to smoking heroin. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the harder pills can be, you know, it, it, we have this common misconception that just because it's you know, heroin, it sounds scary, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine. Um, and they are, they are hard drugs, but there are, you know, pills are also hard drugs too. Um, and so if, you know, if your child's doing <laughs> pills versus heroin, that doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I'm relieved, you know, it's just pills. You, you can't look at it that way. Um, <clears throat> and I avoided heroin for a long time, John, for that specific reason. And what you're talking about is, that sort of idea that, oh, you know, heroin, that's really serious. Like, I don't want to resort to that. I don't want to go there. Um, but, you know, everyone eventually does after long enough, um, you know, if they're addicted to opiates. And for many years, I actually held off, I guess, which is kind of uncommon. I avoided IVing the drug for actually like three years. Um, I was scared to IV. Um, 
I, you know, I've seen what it does to people. Once you use the IV, you will never go back. You will never go back to smoking it. You will never go back to any other way because the, the feeling you get is so great that, you know, and, and, and invigorating, I guess, that you, you just, you're not going to go back. Um, and there's a lot of dangers that come with IV use, obviously, you know, if you're sharing needles and um, that sort of thing. But uh, it's kind of a, a, a... You mean you mean like AIDS and other types of things? Uh, right? Yeah, and, you know, hepatitis and things right. like that. Yeah. Um, but it's a really scary place to be in, um, to be in full-blown addiction, because you understand that you are not if you've if you've gone through it enough times it's very clear to you, to you that you are not going to stop until something really bad happens um you you know i had to hit a further low each time i would relapse i had to hit a worse place than i had the past time even though i thought oh my gosh like that that you know, the reason I stopped last time, that was really severe. Um, I can't imagine anything worse. And then something worse happens. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> it's scary realizing that you are not going to be able to stop yourself. Um, when you when you become addicted, um, you treat the drug as if it were water or or oxygen in a way, you know you cannot live without it so you will not like i said you will not be able to carry out any of your other tasks unless you were high if you're a full-blown addict and it's really it's really hard for you know like my wife for example until she really understood the inner workings of addiction how could she not feel like heroin is more important to me than her and my daughters how could she not feel that way? I have to be high in order to go to work to provide for my family. I have to be high in order to spend time with my wife. I have to be high in order to, you know, just have the energy and the desire to take my daughters out to go play on the playground, you know? Um, and that's a huge guilt factor for uh, me as an addict when I'm in that position. Um, but I, I guess it's important to, to state and for people to know that um, although the drug becomes priority over even your family, it doesn't, that's not because they truly, it's not because they truly um, love the drug in a, <laughs> in a love sort of way. It's a chemical dependence. It's, it's a, you know what I mean? It's, it's a, it's a love in the sense that you are chemically dependent on it. So it's, it's not that, you know, it's not that you, that, that, uh, the spouse who's not using is not loved anymore, but it certainly will feel that way. No doubt. That you weren't loved. That, that, that you're, that you're using, um, spouse is, is more in love with the drug than they are with with you, and uh, it's it's hard. It's hard. And go ahead. So, was there a what what did you hit rock bottom? And and if so, what did rock bottom look like in your life? <clears throat> so it's kind of hard to talk about. I and I'm 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 willing to kind of give some examples, but um, you know. <laughs> Hitting rock bottom could be that I've spent three thousand dollars in a month on heroin, and we have zero dollars left, and we have bills to pay, we have rent to pay. Um, that is very crushing as a man, as a father, who, you know, I'm the I'm the provider. Um, you know, my, my wife, um, has never, um, chosen to go to work. She, she's very shy. She doesn't, she doesn't have the desire to have a career and 
So I am, I'm the provider. Um, and so when I'm not capable of providing for my family, um, that is a really humbling, <laughs> sad position to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, another example is um, one time I was, I was withdrawing. And every drug addict will tell you that withdrawals, they will do, we will do anything to not be in withdrawal because you, you feel like you're dying, but you're, you're not going to die, but you feel like you're dying. Uh, things like Xanax, benzodiazepines, you actually can die withdrawing from those. Um, but opiates, um, you know, you're not going to die, but you are going to be like really, really sick. Chills, fevers, diarrhea, achy bones, and, uh, 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 muscles, um, uh, just you, you're going to be in, in hell. Um, and so you do anything to not feel that way. And I remember, um, this specific time I, I, I needed to go use drugs, uh, to not feel that way. And, um, my, my wife was on to me and, you know, I was giving some dumb excuse, uh, to, to leave the house and she, she knew what was up. So she followed me outside and she would not, she got on the back of our car, actually. Um, I got in the driver's seat and um, I turned the car on and she was, you know, yelling to me, like, open the door, open the other side of the door, let me in. I'm coming with you. This is before we had kids. And um, I kept saying, no, no. And I, I was so just not myself, like, like a depraved animal. That's what you become. Um, that I, I needed to go use. And so I turned the car on and I slowly started backing out, like to warn her, like, look, I'm going to pull away. You better get off the car. Um, and she wouldn't get off. Um, and because she was committed to, to not letting me go, she wanted to do everything in her power to stop me. Um, Later, she learned that, um, you know, really you can't stop someone from making the choice to use drugs. Um, they have to decide on their own. But um, I, I thought she had gotten off the car and, oh, no, no, no. I had unlocked the door, like she said. I stopped the car. I, I was listening to her demands that she wanted me to stop the car and unlock the door so she could sit in the in the passenger seat and so I did and my plan was that I was you know going to um, when she got off the back of the car that I was going to um, pull away well I hadn't realized that she had come up to the passenger side and she had already opened the door at that point and I had peeled away in the car and um, um, she was hanging on to the, just like hanging on, you know, to the, um, the door, um, so she wouldn't fall and get caught under the, the wheel of the car. Um, and, uh, I remember when I was in our apartment complex, um, during the day, I remember when I stopped the car because I realized what was going on, I looked over at her and the look that she gave me was like nothing I had ever seen before. It was like, it was, it was as if I knew exactly what she was thinking and she didn't have to say a word. And the look on her face was like, who are you? I don't even know who you are. Um, it almost like I had been alienated or, or you know, I, I was a different person because she knows that the true me would not put her in that danger. Um, and so, you know, drug addiction uh, pushes us to do really crazy, horrible things. You know, stealing money from family members, um, you know, selling family members uh, expensive items, you know, at the pawn shop, um, you know, anything you can imagine 
uh, you know, where someone might be able to make money off of taking advantage of you. Um, uh, you know, those are all things that drug addicts tend to do. <laughs> Got it. Thanks for sharing something so personal and so hard. Um, yeah, you're welcome. So, um, are you comfortable talking about where you are now in terms of usage? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I recently, um, I've been sober for a few months. Um, I just got through the worst of my, um, relapses I've, I had ever had. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> my wife and I have lived our whole lives in California. We grew up there. Um, but we've lived here in Utah for a year. We moved up here because I had gotten a job that I had been applying to for like a year straight. Um, and we, we really wanted this, this job, um, for me, um, because it would, it would, uh, provide us with a good opportunity in Utah to, to make decent money and, and live cheap, cheaply in Utah, you know? And, um, so we moved up here and about six months into my job, um, we, I mean, um, there was a, a company wide layoff, um, that, that occurred. Um, and I was one of the people, uh, getting laid off. Um, <laughs> the day that I got laid off that they called me into work to, to fire me. Um, they, I mean, I had just found out, um, like a couple days prior to that, that we were having our third child totally unplanned. Um, this, you know, we, we were not prepared to have another child. We were not wanting to have another kid for a while, another baby. Um, so, you know, here we are finding out that, you know, my wife is pregnant and, um, which was more of a, a really hard thing to hear. Not a happy, not a happy moment at first, you know, it was, it was sobering and scary. And then a couple days later I get laid off. Um, and that was it, you know, it, <laughs> as a drug addict, it, is very scary when you go through uh, any sort of hardship because you know, and my wife knows and fears that anytime a hardship occurs that she has to fear and worry that I'm going to go off the deep end. And so that's exactly what I did. I, um, this is the first time I even started shooting heroin. So that's it. Uh, and I'd never done that before. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I didn't know anybody up here that had drugs. So I had to, you know, search to the ends of earth to, to make that happen and, and do risky things. And, and I did, and I ended up, um, making that happen. Um, so it, it was a bad time. And, um, I, I really put us in a dire position financially, um, I do have to say that I'm very grateful for um, uh, the help of uh, my bishop. He has been so understanding and helpful uh, to help us financially during this time. And um, it, without that help, we would be uh, we wouldn't have a place to live. So, so the church can be the good guy. Sometimes the church can help <laughs> someone. The church can help someone with funds. So what did they give you money to seek treatment? Is that what happened or? Um, no, uh, just for our, our, you know, our rent and, uh, and our utilities. Um, but, um, oh, okay. So to help you make ends meet. Yeah. But also I was, we, we did some research and, you know, my Bishop was like, I want you to heal completely from this. I don't want to just put a bandaid on this. Um, I will, I will support you financially in any treatment that you need, which was really awesome. Um, but I ended up uh, finding this place. I don't know if you've heard of it in Provo. It's called uh, Project Reality. There's one in uh, Salt Lake as well. 
Um, it's a, a methadone clinic. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about, about methadone. Um, another one is Suboxone, which is these are drugs that um, are administ administered to you um, under um, uh, strict conditions. Um, so, and, and these drugs, um, they, they reduce or sort of kill your cravings for, for opiates. Um, and in fact, if you, even if, if you try to go get high, the, the drug that you're taking, the methadone or the um, suboxone, uh, prevents you from even feeling high. Um, and so uh, I am fortunate enough to um, have Medicaid totally cover my treatment at Project Reality, which is awesome. So I go in every day, and they, uh, the nurse gives me the, the medicine, and I, you have to take it right there in front of them. There's a lot of accountability. Um, and then you're also required to do um, a certain amount of therapy every week. Um, I love my therapist. She has helped me tremendously. Um, even though I've had a th therapist in the past, I mean, she is awesome. And uh, I've done a lot of uh, work with her, processed a lot of um, tough things. And, uh, you know, you get to step up in the program um, by if you, if you show that you are staying on track, that you're staying sober, um, they end up, uh, you, you know, you can be on these different levels of, of uh, uh, trust um, where they will allow you to actually take home the medication for one of those days. Um, and then eventually, if you get to a high enough step, you actually get to take in or you take home medicine, that, the methadone for, you know, the whole entire week. Um, but otherwise when you're first starting, you have to go in every single day and, uh, take, uh, the methadone, but it's been, it's been awesome. I've been able to have my life, my life back. I've been able to, um, you know, be a father and, um, I, I'm just so grateful. I, I've been able to be, uh, active with my kids and, um, spending time with them and just feeling good about myself. So, as a, you've as been, a father. so you've been clean for a few months. Yeah, since April. Are there, uh, what about the support groups, Narcoholics Anonymous or Alcoholics? Yeah. You know, are those it, things you would go to or have used? or? Yeah, I have in the past. Um, uh, you know, for some people, they're great. For other people, they're not as great. Um, but uh, I've never been to one in Utah. I'm curious to, I guess I'd be curious to know how, how they'd be. Um, the culture is very different here than it is in California. Um, but I haven't personally gone to any up here. Um, I do do uh, three hours of individual therapy a week and three hours of group therapy a week. So I've been doing very intensive outpatient sort of um, therapy um, along with the methadone treatment. Um, but yeah, those can be definitely helpful. You know, you get a sponsor. Um, uh, you know, it's about, it's about accountability and, uh, um, you know, you get your chip when you've gone a certain amount of days, uh, without using drugs and it feels good to, to, you know, get those chips, even if it's like 30 days, it's like you, you're proud of yourself, you know, everyone cheers for you and claps for you and it feels good. Um, of course the church does have their, um, their program, which, um, I have been to plenty of those. Um, I'm not sure where my opinion kind of lies with that program. I think there's some questionable, some questionable attributes of it. Um, have you heard much about the church's program? The, just, just mostly when people take this 12 step program in the church, that it's just for masturbation. And so I've got a negative association with it. Oh yeah. All these yeah. men and their yeah. wives and talking. Wait, they about run this. one specifically for masturbation. I know they do one for pornography and one for drug abuse, but are you saying there's one specifically for masturbation? Well, a lot of or pornography with... and masturbation are, you know, it's yeah, the same yeah, thing. That's true. They, they that's happen true. simultaneously. Right. So right. I don't know whether the church's program is, is helpful or not to drug addicts, but um, 
I love I I love that you're getting treatment. Um, talk about uh, sort of like uh, relapsing rates with with op- opiate sort of addicts, oh. and you know you hear this thing once an addict always an addict and sobriety and you know you're never fully recovered. Can you talk about what you what you know about that? <clears throat> So there are, um, you know, different statistics like, um, you know, 30 days in, in rehab. Um, you know, if you leave after 30 days, you're, you're this likely to relapse. It's like a really high relapse rate. Um, you know, and the longer you, the longer you obviously stay off of the drug, the better chances you have. But I, I, I don't know actual like yeah, you okay. know, hard statistics, but, but it's worth mentioning that relapse rates are i mean absolutely common i mean if you're a, if you're a full blown addict i would be absolutely shocked if you your first round were able to get off the drug and set it aside forever i mean that 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 i don't think i i've ever heard of that if you're truly addicted because it 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 changes your your brain chemistry when you are uh in these addictions for such a long period of time um and just re, you know relapsing it's sad to say but it's a very common part of of dealing with addiction and and you know uh it is something once an addict always an addict you know i i agree with that in the sense that once you're addicted to you know whatever your your drug of choice is you will never be able to be around that drug again you will never be able to take that drug and just take it one time you know you're always you're always going to be addicted to it or have that tendency does that make sense yeah it does um what can you tell us about your wife and your your thoughts and feelings around her sticking with you during such a hard thing. Oh, I, I am so grateful. I, you know, um, <clears throat> she, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful that she has taken the time to understand the dynamics of my addiction. Um, it could be very easy for one to, to just not, you know, just be like, okay, I'm done. This, this is, this is, this is too much for me. I'm leaving without actually trying to understand why, um, you know, your spouse is, is using drugs, um, and why it is so hard. Now I'm not discounting or uh, minimizing the, the pain of anybody who, um, just kind of throws their hands up and, and leaves the marriage. But I just, I think that would be a lot easier than sticking with your spouse who has a, an addiction. But, um, you know, my wife is a huge part of my, my desire and my ability to stay sober. And so are my daughters. Um, <laughs> excuse me, my voice dressed me. Um, and, uh, you know, she, um, what's important to me is that she doesn't stick around because she doesn't have anywhere to go or because she's intimidated by me. You know, that, that, that would make me feel horrible if she was just (laughs) staying with me out of fear, which is a totally a common thing. You know, I mean, I know, I know, I know married couples who have been married for years and, um, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, the spouses have has been using forever and the other one can't seem to to leave because they are um intimidated and, and they have you know it's not easy to go through a divorce with kids um but i'm just glad that my wife sticks by my side and supports me and that that she she's you know she's in it for a good reason you know she's not just staying just to you know, because she can't go. Shout out to her. <laughs> okay. So as we kind of wrap up for today, uh, I'm going to give you a couple different groups of people and I'm going to ask you to sort of give 
some really quick advice to each group. So okay. for somebody considering um, drugs or self-medication, what, what can you say to them? Is there anything you can say to prevent someone from going there or are people just going to do it no matter what? Uh, like I said before, like, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I, 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 I would try not to be surprised if your kid, your child experiments. Um, but you know, you know, there's a right way to go about that. Um, I, I, I don't know if there really is a way to just ensure that your child isn't going to use or ever try or experiment with a drug, but, um, definitely what would help, um, prevent a full-blown addiction um, coming into fruition would be making sure that your child has a relationship with you, like you're saying, John, in which they feel they can talk to you so that if they do experiment, it can be discussed and, um, you know, you can kind of discuss why, you know, they, they shouldn't do that. Um, but you know, it kind of, the problem kind of lays or, or lies with the, uh, the upbringing of the child or whatever has happened, you know, in their life. Um, you know, uh, you know, if you have that open connection and relationship, you should be able to identify also or before drug usage. Um, if there's some other like under underlying problem, uh, some type of trauma and, the best thing to do is get help for your child for that root cause or that root issue like we were talking about. If you can get that root, the root of the problem addressed before, um, you know, your child feels like they want to use uh, or, or, or have a tendency to use, then you're going to be much better off. Love it. What would you say to someone who is addicted uh, how to come clean? Oh. you know i i i think you know i don't have my way is not the only way there are many ways to go about um getting clean um and uh something different works for you know each individual person um but there i guess the most important thing to know is that there are like even in the 10 years that i was that I have used and dealt with this addiction um, over 10 years, I wish I would have known sooner about some of the, um, the services and programs and different things that are available to, to, to drug addicts to help them. Actually, here in the state of Utah, um, a drug addict is, is considered a person with a disability um, because it is a, a form of a disability. Um, the person isn't using because they're a bad person and they just want to do bad things. They are, they have a, a deep rooted psychological something going in, in, on inside of them and they need help. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a form of a disability. And, uh, um, there is, um, there are programs that will financially back, um, those, those, uh, recovering drug addicts who are trying to, uh, better themselves and and stay off drugs. You know, uh, financial backing and support, uh, resources for uh, getting a job um, that will work for you. Um, I mean, there are, there's so much. The other part, John, is that there's nothing that can be said to any drug addict, you know, <laughs> anywhere uh, that is going to make them have the desire to stop using. Um, unfortunately that typically only comes about when they hit a low because they have to, we always hear this, the drug addict has to decide that they're done. And that's absolutely true. But usually uh, the addiction, the mental psychological aspect of it is so powerful and the chemical uh, dependency that, you know, uh, sort of a, a, a realization or a reality check doesn't occur until they hit a very low point. Got it. Okay. Um, that makes sense. And so for other loved ones or even bishops or church leaders, 
what can we do to help someone uh, who's struggling? You've already said maintain that connection. Is there anything else we can do? Yeah, I mean, you know, don't, you know, I don't judge something that you have no idea personally, like you haven't experienced. Um, uh, I, I think, I think people really, uh, you know, like for, you know, other people who don't understand and have not experienced something like addiction personally, the addict, you know, or me, for example, I like when people approach me and, you know, instead of talking behind my back or, or, or judging me, I, I appreciate it when they want to understand why I use and, um, and oftentimes, um, you know, they, you know, they, <laughs> they realize like, oh, okay, I, that, that makes sense. Like I haven't experienced that, but that, that makes sense more. You know, I just thought you, I just thought you use because you think it feels good you know, like there are a lot of misconceptions. So having that understanding and that loving support where, where uh, the addict feels safe around you. Okay. And they're not going to be judged. Um, and then just offering them the support that they need. Like some of these programs I've talked about, there, there are medical treatments. Um, there are outpatient inpatient rehabs. Um, and providing those services so or offering help with um you know kind of getting involved with those services so that when the addict reaches a point a low point where they're like i'm done with this i i i want to change they know exactly who to go to because at one time you had offered to them or told them that you um that you want to help them in in these sort of ways don't be don't don't be shocked if you know if they're in their addiction and you have this great offer, um, you know, and they don't take it, 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 you know, it may, and that may not be until down the road when they hit that low that they come back to you. But the important thing is that they do come back to you and take you up on that offer or, um, you know, uh, come to get your help. Love it. Any final words you want to say about if or how any of this has affected your faith and, we don't have to even go there if, it, if you don't think that's an important thing to mention. Well, it is though. Um, you know, I, um, it's really tough when, you know, you have a serious shaking in, in your faith when your faith, you know, has shaped your understanding of everything. You know, the church isn't just uh, a, a religion um, where, you know, we, you know, do certain practices or rituals or um, believe certain things. It actually, you know, Mormonism actually provides uh, sort of a uh, its own understanding or explanation for how the world works. Okay. Like, for example, we go through trials, you know we're told we'll go through trials. We're here to go through trials to better ourselves and, and, and to, um, uh, you know, perfect ourselves. Um, well, when that all gets sort of shaken and your whole foundation gets shaken and you are questioning, um, your, your perception of reality that has been based off of or filtered through the church, you know, my, what I'm kind of going through right now is thinking like, well, you know, I used to think that there was some bigger purpose to going through being sexually abused and, um, you know, and, and my brother dying and, 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 you know, just causing so many people so much pain, uh, with this drug addiction and wasting so much of my life to this horrible addiction. Like, what is the purpose you know, that, that's what, that's, what's been kind of hard for me is just, you know, when, when I was, had a super strong testimony and did not question anything, I had a, a, a sort of an idea in mind of a bigger purpose. Um, but I'm still very much in the middle of kind of my faith crisis. Um, I just, 
you know, it's been harder and harder for me to go to church and sit there and just feel so not included, like just so different. So, you know, (laughs) it's not even that I say anything. It's just, I feel like I'm alone, even though I'm surrounded by people because, because the narrative that I have grown to know um, is not the real narrative. And so um, it just has been increasingly harder and harder to, to go to church and to, to, to be really invested. And in the past, that has been a vital part in me staying sober. So really, John, I think it's like a matter of finding finding what makes me stay sober, what helps me, what keeps me happy. Um, and, um, you know, I, that's a little scary right now cause I'm not sure where, you know, what my, my beliefs are. They're, they're mm. in question. Yeah. And I imagine, and I'm just guessing, I don't mean to project, but I imagine that it would be such a hard, potentially a really hard conflict between wanting to hold on to the religion as a source of moral or community support or even financial support. Right. And, and not only sometimes questioning its claims, but also recognizing that maybe many of the damaging messages that religion can put forward could be some of the underpinnings for your addiction. Yes. Is that a, is that a conflict you experience? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, um, yeah. See, so because because of this sort of questioning and this crisis of faith, it makes me look back and and be like, oh my gosh, like this is so unhealthy. Like, like the like you were saying, John, the, these 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 um, uh, certain messages and and ideas within the LDS culture are still very present today, and they're still they're still you know, those same unhealthy messages are, are still being <laughs> sort of spread around today. And um, I just, I look back and, and just realize how, how, how could I not, or how could any Mormon not have experienced some sort of psychological something, whether it be, whether it be shame or, you know, shame of their bodies or, um, you know, just being hard on themselves or not thinking they're good enough or, you know, like, it's just really hard for me to sit with that. Yeah. And it makes, it makes me scared for my children. Um, I don't want them to soak in any of this negative messaging at all. You know? Sure. Sure. So. Um, And man, if religion helps you get well. I want you to get well, however you can get well. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's so hard. Appreciate that. Well, um, just to close, thank you so (laughs) much again, uh, for being willing to share your story with us. It's so brave. It's so valuable, Thomas. Uh, and I just, I did this series to give hope to people so that they know that you can, you know, that this stuff is serious let's get educated about it and um, let's, let's go ahead and educate ourselves so that we can help ourselves and others get better. And that's the right. spirit with which this has all happened. Um, I appreciate, I appreciate so, you allowing me to kind of talk about it. Yeah. Um, and that, and that, that, that is a huge part of it, John education, you know, that's really just getting educated and, about this stuff because if you haven't gone through it yourself obviously you're not gonna you know there's some there's some things to learn so beautiful sure. um just one last time vicky asks where should an addict go to find these programs you're talking about what 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 would you say and we can put links on on the blog post but so uh the uh utah department of health um in provo i think that's what it's called um, I went in there, um, where did I go? Um, I went in there and they like assessed me and they like, um, they assessed how much they were going to help me financially based off, um, 
you know, my, our expenses and, you know, whether I have a job or not. And they, uh, uh, gave me resources like, uh, whether it be outpatient rehab, um, or, uh, you know, the methadone clinic or, um, therapy services. Um, I, I don't, I apologize. I don't know specifically what department I went into, but if you call the Utah uh, Department of Health and you, um, I'm sure they direct you to the right place if you just um, ask for services for addicts. Um, and really just searching online, I mean, and I, I know it sounds cliche, but in Google, like all of the, the services and the, 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 uh, the organizations that help addicts, there are a ton. There are a ton in Utah. What, what, was, the one, what was the one you went to? Um, it's called Project Reality, okay. but they offer other things, other services at the uh, Utah Department of Health. Um, okay. Project Reality Utah. And so that's I'm in Provo. A, there's one in Salt Lake too. So that's projectreality.net. Uh, it okay. looks like that's the website for people. I'll go ahead and post it to uh, the Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page. Okay. Uh, there's another one that I just found called Discovery House. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Comprehensive Treatment Centers of Utah. Mm -hmm. um, that looks. That's just a. And this is just a different form of treatment for you know. Like I said, every every person is different, but some people have tried so many different rehabs, and they just can't seem to you know stay sober. There's a different option of being uh, medicated. Um, uh, on something that really helps you not think about drugs and not want to use. And I have found it very valuable for myself. Okay. So Utah Department of Health, utahctc.com, projectreality.net are just a few of the many programs. Yeah. Yep. Available. For sure. Yeah. All right. Oh, cool. Well, um, again, uh, Thomas, thank you so much for being willing to come on Mormon Stories. I'm, I'm sure you're going to save at least a life or two from your courage. So we can't thank you enough. <laughs> I hope. All right. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Uh, and to all our listeners out there, thank you so much for joining us today on Mormon Stories. Please check us out at mormonstories.org if you want to comment on this episode, if you want to share experiences or resources. If you want to come on Mormon Stories, if you've got a story to tell, email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. And we'll uh, look at your story and see if we can fit it in. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone who donates to Mormon Stories. You keep this alive. Please consider donating at mormonstories.org. Uh, you can click on the donate button, $10, $20 a month. Uh, a, a monthly subscription can really make a difference. If you can do more, uh, that's great. All our, uh, all our contributions are tax deductible in the United States and go towards keeping this podcast alive, keeping the Open Stories Foundation alive, supporting our staff, and allowing us to do events, uh, workshops, retreats, etc., to help people. So please uh, support us if you can. Uh, check us out for future episodes of Mormon Stories. Please feel free to check out mormonstories.org slash events if you want to attend one of our upcoming workshops or retreats. Uh, those are super useful to people. So again, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, please tune in again soon, and uh, we just appreciate all the support. Take care, everybody. Thanks, all right. Bye. Talk soon.